Welcome to the first part of uh, the Nova Scotia College of Social Workers Advocacy Day. And we are very excited about this morning session that we are co-hosting and co-organizing with the Canadian Mental Health Association of Nova Scotia. And uh, this event, this community forum is uh, the start of what we hope will be a collaborative conversation with the Office of Mental Health and Addictions. But I would like to begin first and foremost by acknowledging that I am in Mi'kmaq, and that is the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. Their inherent rights to this land were recognized in the Peace and Friendship Treaties, which Mi'kmaq, Wolastiwuk, and Passamaquoddy people signed with the British Crown from 1725 to 1779. This series of treaties did not surrender Indigenous land, resources, or sovereignty to the British Empire, but instead established rules for an ongoing relationship between multiple nations. The treaties were later reaffirmed by Canada in Section 35 of the Constitution Act in 1982, and they remain active to this day. We affirm our commitment to join together with our communities in the necessary labor of reconciliation, and we are grateful to live and work together as treaty people in Mi'kmaq. Without action, acknowledgements are empty. Whether you are with us in Mi'kmaq or joining us from elsewhere, please consider whose territory you are in, your relationship with that land, and your relationships with the Indigenous people who have lived and continue to live in that place. I invite you to take a few moments now, perhaps look out the window, see how the earth has graced us this morning with beautiful snow, mm -hmm. invite us to reflect on that beauty, connecting to the themes of reconciliation and justice and reflect on how each of us as individuals and as a community can hold ourselves accountable to reconciliation with indigenous peoples here and across Turtle Island. Wulaliu, thank you all. And I want to now gratefully welcome Elder Ella Paul from Millbrook First Nation to help us begin our day of advocacy. I'm going to just uh, find her. There she is. Hold on a sec. Good morning. Um, welcome to Mi'kmaq. And I'm going to open with a prayer. Mental health and addictions is so important for our people in Mi'kmaq and uh, the Mi'kmaq. In my community alone, in the last week, we've lost I think we had four deaths in a week. We're, we, Solid Day is, a, is a, a thing we have, which is um, an auction where we help families. We have one, and before one is completed, we're doing another one, starting another one. So we're behind on our Solid Days and helping the people who've lost loved ones. But it's been really hard. It's, it's hard even for somebody who's strong to uh, see so much death in, one, in, in, so, in such a short time. But anyway, uh, I would like to pray for all of us who are here. I pray for um, our community members. I pray for the uh, officials. I pray for the uh, frontline workers who are working in addictions and mental health. I pray that you give them the strength to have compassion and understanding and that you, you give them the proper tools and the right tools to help people to um, become strong again. Nogama and have a good meeting. Thank you. Thank you so very much. We now will hear from Alex Stratford, Executive Director and Registrar of the Nova Scotia College of Social Workers. Welcome, good morning all. Um, how's that uh, spring vibe feeling this morning for you? Um, again, uh, although I joke, we do hope that this day provides 
a moment of renewal and a, a moment of hope uh, for the type of mental health and substance use programs and systems that we know we can achieve uh, and we know uh, it, it is uh, something that we desperately need at this moment in time. Um, hope is uh, an important uh, aspect of what we want to build here uh, and a, a recognition uh, that it can be done, uh, that uh, people telling us, oh, we can't achieve uh, our vision for mental health or that that won't fly. Uh, just it, it doesn't sit well as we see folks um, engage in a fight for democracy across the globe. Ultimately, our public uh, services are, are there to be accountable to us, um, the people. And that is what we hope this day inspires, is that we can build a movement towards the systems that we need. I'm delighted to be here today to hear directly from community on how we can turn both promises that we've heard about mental health and substance use into policy, uh, as well as what we haven't heard yet. And that's what I'm excited for about today, is that there is a lot that has not been said, has not been picked up uh, by, um, uh, again, our current government that needs to be brought into the forefront of mental health and substance use policy. I'm happy to be here and happy to place this event as part of uh, Social Work Month. Uh, in March of last year, Canada was hopeful that the year ahead would provide us with the opportunity to take a collective sigh of relief. And though vaccines have provided hope for a path forward, this year was more difficult than ever uh, for social workers and the people they serve across the country and here in Nova Scotia. And so this year's theme is quite fitting. In critical demand, social work is essential. Throughout COVID-19, uh, social workers have demonstrated uh, the, the, uh, the criticalness that they bring, uh, particularly in the face uh, of an eroding social safety net um, with those pre-existing gaps that uh, were exposed throughout the COVID uh, pandemic. And despite all the personal and professional challenges, social workers rise to the occasion, providing exceptional service, care, and leadership to people and communities across Nova Scotia. Uh, I am... Uh, very pleased uh, and very humbled to be able to stand here today uh, and acknowledge uh, those contributions and to help lift them up. Uh, social work educators and students and practitioners have all recognized our need uh, to, and our continued desire uh, to work towards greater social justice, equity, and in critical self-reflection, advance reconciliation, anti-racism, and push equity. This March, we will celebrate social work, uh, social workers' amazing work more loudly than ever. But though National Social Work Month is a time to celebrate, it's also a time to reflect. And this year's celebration must go hand in hand with the recognition of the very real, very serious, indeed critical difficulties faced by our profession. Even prior to the pandemic, social workers were often overworked as professionals as professional care has continued to be devalued. But now, as, as social workers have continued to do their essential work through the third calendar year in a once-in-a-generation pandemic, uh, it's becoming quite known, uh, again, that this work of professional care is incredibly valued uh, and must be uh, uh, given the acknowledgement that it deserves. Uh, while we acknowledge and celebrate the extraordinary devotion of social workers and their pivotal roles, especially in the context of this of the world events going on, we remain aware of the urgency of our opportunities for growth. The uncovering of mass unmarked graves of stolen and beloved Indigenous children on the grounds of former residential schools across the country brought renewed global attention to the historical and contemporary realities of colonialism in Canada. The ongoing efforts to locate and honor these little ones reminds us of the active involvement of our profession in colonial violence and our collective responsibility to continue to transform this legacy and champion decolonial change. The ongoing centering of whiteness and subsequent systemic violence of anti-Black, anti-Asian, anti-Indigenous, anti-Indigenous uh, anti racism, anti-Semitism, and Islamophobia we have witnessed during the pandemic continues to remind us of the responsibility of our profession in preserving care and social work values grounded in integrity, ethical practice, and equitable service to humanity so that we are being uh, practiced and taught in a consistent, anti-oppressive, and sustainable manner. Despite these challenges, it is a fundamental to our profession to close with a message of hope and resilience. As a profession grounded in principles of social justice, optimism comes naturally. As we see a better world so clearly, 
uh, if we actualize and bring to life the right policies. We are secure in the knowledge that our profession is united in our shared commitment to sustain social change and to continue to transform the legacy of our profession through our daily efforts uh, on the front lines in our classrooms and our, in our offices. For our part in our respective roles and alongside those who are most vulnerable before governments and policymakers and regulating the profession, we are working for a better future for social workers, uh, those they serve and all Nova Scotians and Canadians. Last year, the theme of National Social Work Month was Social Work is Essential. It was chosen to reflect the essential roles that social workers uh, have played, uh, not only before and during the pandemic, but also the ones that we will play uh, towards a just recovery. This year, while the situation was critical uh, and remains critical, we are more certain than ever uh, that uh, our, our members, our registrants, social workers across the country uh, will bring and help lead to brighter days ahead. I look forward to hearing directly from Community Today on mental health and substance use. We know uh, from our own research um, uh, that we have partnered with, with our uh, faculty at Dalhousie School of Social Work, um, that we have currently implemented a very top-down uh, uh, top bureaucratic mental health programming, uh, coupled with a limited understanding of the devastating impacts of Nova Scotia's uh, erosion of our social safety net uh, and the impact that this has on mental health and substance use. This has resulted in policy and programming that views substance use and mental health primary as a biological concern and negates the social and political impact on prevention and healing. It is my hope coming out of today that we will have more clearly a comprehensive and a robust mental health substance use policy and strategy uh, to get us where we need to land. Uh, I'm uh, very grateful to hear from all of you today uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to the conversation ahead. Thank you so much. Hi there. Uh, my name is Karn Nichols and I'm the executive director of the Canadian Mental Health Association, the Nova Scotia Division. Um, the work that we do is non-clinical support. We support Nova Scotians in their mental health journey. And essentially, there are three pillars in what we do. One is navigation, one is education, and the final one is advocacy. And today is really about advocacy. So it's both my pleasure and my privilege to be part of the partnership with the Nova Scotia College of Social Workers on this event. There's a quote by uh, Margaret Wheatley that says, very great change starts from very small conversations among people who care. And I'd like to think that's, that's what's happening today. Today, we've been intentional about providing the ingredients and the conditions for that change that we all aspire to. Today, you'll have the opportunity to hear in the first voice from 10 of our community members. It's our hope that the worldviews and perspectives of these voices may inform and direct the way we think about mental health and addictions and the policies. This is an opportunity for us all to be heard. Your opinions and lived experience really does matter. To that end, I encourage you to share your questions and comments in the chat. And while we may not get to all of the questions today, please know that we'll be collecting and collating all of it to share back with our policy members. And so without further ado, over to Sean Ponabalam, the chair of the Halifax Dartmouth Board of the CMAJ Nova Scotia to moderate the morning. Over to you, Sean. Good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for the intro, Karn. As you said, I'm the chair of uh, the Halifax branch of the Canadian Mental Health Association. And uh, we've, we've had a long history of being an advocate and a grassroots community mental health organization. We're very happy to be a part of this event. Um, today, the intention was to have uh, everyone uh, give their input uh, to Dr. Hickox, who was uh, supposed to be here, but it seems like things are, are running a bit uh, unpredictably and Dr. Hickox is not able to be with us at this moment in time. We'll keep everybody posted uh, to see if they're able to join um, partway through this meeting. That being said, uh, the intention of today was always to gather everybody's feedback. And so what we're going to do is we're going to uh, record this uh, entire uh, meeting today, um, this town hall. And we're also going to gather everybody's questions that 
they post in chat and we'll be giving those to both uh, Dr. Hickox, who again is the, uh, the head of the Office of uh, Addictions and Mental Health in Nova Scotia, but also to uh, Minister Brian Comer, who is the minister responsible for the Office uh, of Addictions and Mental Health. So uh, with that said, uh, we're going to have a number of, of folks give, uh, give their thoughts, but also perhaps a question that we will send over to the, uh, the, uh, the minister and the chief officer. Um, I will be holding everyone to a fairly strict timeline. They've all, everybody has been given uh, three to five minutes to give uh, their statements. And um, if it looks like we're sort of running a bit over time, I will interrupt you at about the four minutes and 30 seconds mark and, and let you know. Um, and so with, with all of that out of the way, all the housekeeping out of the way, uh, I'll invite Angela Ring, who is a registered social worker in private practice based in Middleton uh, with extensive working experience in the field of mental health uh, and addictions to be our first contribu contributor. Hi, Angela. My name is Angela Ring, and I had been employed with the Nova Scotia Health Authority for 14 years. Um, during my time with the Health Authority, I've seen a diminishment of services with addiction portion of the mental health and addiction program, particularly within the last number of years. So I guess what I have to say here is not new. It is well known that folks who struggle with addiction have been deeply affected by some form of life adversity and are using substances as a way to cope with unresolved issues. They are often not able to mean employment, have low social support, and often have unstable housing, are dealing with legal issues and concurrent mental health issues. They are a vulnerable portion of the population and are at significant risk of harm. Despite this, there has been a notable reduction of services tailored to meet the needs of this population. Clients who used to have ready access to clinical treatment through a dedicated addiction-based program are now considered general mental health clients. They are now subject to lengthy wait times, which does not consider the reality of active addiction and relapse patterns, which often cannot wait for service. Inpatient services such as withdrawal management programs and comprehensive wraparound treatment programs have been significantly reduced and transformed into day programs. This leaves a, port, a, this leaves a portion of very ill individuals in the community without the ability to participate in withdrawal programs as they are not safe to return to their home to continue with withdrawal management treatment. This, uh, unfortunately, places people at risk and, it, and, and uh, vulnerable to crisis, um, placing more strain um, on other areas of the healthcare system, including the emergency department and psychiatric services. I've also seen a cutting of gender-based programs with which women and women struggling with addictions issues used to have access tailored to meet their own individual needs uh, with, uh, with, with, with gender and the harm uh, and risk that goes with that. Um, additionally, services have been cut in rural areas, which has increased barriers due to transportation issues, lack of access to Wi-Fi, mobile, mobile service, and general unstable housing and lifestyle circumstances. The above barriers to service has led to an attrition of people using addiction services who are now at greater risk without addiction specific services. I am aware that Nova Scotia Health Authority's mission statement is healthy people, healthy communities for generations. And I wonder how this is being met with the current state of lack of service provision for the addiction population. Thank you. Okay, um, so, and just to, to let folks know in case uh, it, it becomes apparent, some of, some of our uh, contributors will be giving um, uh, their statements by video. And so that was Angela. 
Uh, next, uh, we have uh, a video from uh, Blair Kasouf. Uh, Blair is a registered social worker and a lawyer uh, based out of Cape Breton with extensive experience working in the field of mental health and addictions. My name is uh, Blair Kasouf and this is being recorded March 8th as I may not be in the province uh, during the uh, seminar. Um, I'm in Cape Breton, I'm a lawyer and social worker, been a few other things as well, and I've been around the system a long time. Focusing on uh, addictions today, uh, just have a couple of minutes to speak on it. In my observations over the last quite a few years, there seems to have been a, a uh, in regard to the field of addiction, there seems to be uh, a categorization of it now as just another quote unquote disorder. Um, I can just touch on three items very quickly. First is inpatient detox beds. Uh, back in the summer of 2018, uh, a bunch of detox beds and uh, centers were cut or closed very, very quietly, despite uh, a year before saying that that would not be done. Uh, the There is detox programs in this province that is nothing new. They have their place. Uh, detox programs have been around in Cape Breton since 2004, 2005 on and off. But inpatient detox beds are a medical necessity. Uh, when you don't have accessible detox beds, essentially the individual is at risk. Sure, they can go to ER, but really that's not where they want to be or that's not where ER wants them. And for the most part, the person may very well end up back just back in their addiction again, or they may become involved with the police or paramedics, or as I say, the ER. Um, so my question there is, will these decisions to cut and close these facilities be reviewed and whether there'll be open and honest consultations with the community to, to put this back on track? Uh, what happens with services when they go away, they don't tend to come back and, and people adjust, but not in a healthy way. Uh, the second thing is addiction hubs. Uh, Pre-election, there was indications that there was going to be five addiction hubs uh, uh, put in this province. That was in the spring of, of last year. Uh, seemed like a good idea at the time when I heard it, although perhaps reinventing the wheel of a, of a wheel or a tire that's been somewhat flattened. As it turned out in January, uh, the first hub was, was opened in, in Dartmouth. Seemed like a great thing. Uh, but the press releases indicated that the other hubs would be open within another two years. Now, my question again is, is that correct? Maybe it's not, but if it is, why will it take two years to do that? Uh, basically, from a, facility, a facilities management point of view, you're talking about accessible floor space and furniture. So uh, it would be nice to clarify that. And I would suggest that if there's political or organizational will, the addictions hub should be opened fairly soon. Uh, the third thing is uh, residential treatment facilities. So in other words, the old 21 day, 28 day programs, which were inpatient treatment facilities. To clarify for some people watching, those are not detox beds, nor are, there, are they long-term residential facilities such as Talbot Host, Marguerite Host and places like that. They're separate type of uh, programs. Uh, the 28, 21, 28 day programs are therapeutic programs, which, what you hear a lot these days is a lot of talk about uh, trauma therapy, trauma-based uh, therapy. And what happens in those programs when it's properly run, and I've worked in them, this is what was dealt with in those programs, real trauma in a safe and support and, uh, environment that had 24 hour support. You can't deal with this stuff and throw people back out on the street. And it's a, it's a complicated matter. There are, uh, there are a couple of programs, luckily for indigenous people that still exist, Mi'kmaq Lodge and, and, and Eagle's Nest. But basically what's happened is five, I believe five or more private facilities now exist in this province at four and $500 a day. So two, two tier system, you got money, you get help. And uh, in some of those facilities even have medical detox programs now because of the lack of facilities in the, in the province. So again, my question being, is this being reviewed and looked at in is there proper consultation in the communities about the removal of these programs and to put them back? So thank you for listening.
Okay. Um, next, uh, we have um, Tristan Cole. Uh, Tristan is a first voice speaker who is a student at Dalhousie University. My name is Hi, my name's Tristan. I want to start with how long it has taken me to even be able to do public speaking, because I only learned last year that I had a right to communicate in whatever way works best for me. I'm autistic and I've had disability supports for over a decade, yet I did not know I had rights as a disabled person if I wasn't going along with advised approaches or trying to do things quote unquote normal. I'm really grateful to get to learn and find supportive profs who've connected me to resources and encouraged me and told me that I'm worth it. If there's one thing I want young disabled people to grow up knowing is they don't just deserve to be themselves in all that means, but it is their right. I think truly believing disabled people have rights to equity had become before I could recognize I also am worth being actually included in society. Maybe if healthcare and disability services didn't perpetuate ableism, racism, transphobia, and really all the sorts of ignorance to intersecting identities and access needs, then mental illness wouldn't be so deadly to marginalized communities. Homelessness, mental health, and disability rights are all intertwined for me. I couldn't access disability supports when I was homeless and my huge concern is the DSP policy on addiction essentially meaning I'd lose services if I ever relapsed or if my mental health got too bad for too long I'd also lose services and would more likely end up homeless and dead than in an institution based on past experience but either is possible. I see a lot of overlap between disability, mental illness and homelessness and it's frustrating to see the same barriers keep hurting so many people. I think the solution is more coordinated services between healthcare, continuing care, DSP, outreach type organizations like Mainline, MOSH, and shelter service providers, to support people through all the stages of getting healthcare, applying for DSP, following through and making sure that barriers don't stop someone from getting further in processes and to make sure people aren't just dropped from a service because they are struggling so no longer that service's responsibility. There is a lack of effort to support disabled people to access disability supports when homeless or precariously housed, which is ridiculous not only in the clear harms to individuals, but even those in power refusing to change are actually making things harder for themselves as often the costs to health and social systems are much greater when individuals' health has declined to need urgent and expensive care. Personally I estimate my health care cost the system hundreds of thousands over a few years whereas my current supports could be covered by that amount for the rest of my life, and the support I needed back then to bridge that gap still do not exist, but I can pretty confidently say the support I needed wouldn't come close to the costs I had on health care, legal systems, and first responders. And yet, the current system still disables people further, rather than empowering people to self-advocate and pursue our dreams. Without people in my corner I don't know where I would be, I was in a small options home and the stress from trauma triggers, lack of consideration for trans or non-binary people, and complete incompetence in how to support me as an autistic person with a great deal of sensory hypersensitivities, communication difficulties, and stress-induced loss of functioning, led them to kick me out stating my needs were too high, which has been a theme where services can help in so many ways I don't need, but in few of the ways I really do need support. It's scary that I totally lost the ability to speak, even text, and that they were telling DSP my needs were too high and kicking me out, I was lucky to have family that could help but it's concerning that I still do not have a clear idea what happens if my abilities change. For example I see the situation could have ended up with me homeless and likely in hospital or dead, or in a larger institution or a group living in which I doubt I could have recovered, so that's scary to wonder how many other disabled people are being actively harmed by incompetence of supposed care leading to assumptions about their abilities and perhaps contributing to a loss of functioning.
So that could be me stuck in a cycle of being overwhelmed and no one taking the time or believing in me enough to try communicate. Because I have so many great opportunities to grow and learn from people who have some really different insights on the experiences I've had, I've started to notice how many situations in my personal life reflect more systemic issues which are troubling to consider. For example, I learned the lack of accountability of independent living service providers is not just a me problem. The disability support program does not track enough information to know if a provider is taking advantage of the system and clients. Thanks to all the amazing people around me I am now confident enough to be assertive and not back down from people trying to guilt me out of holding them accountable. Hi my name's Tristan, I want to start with how long it has taken me to even be able to do public speaking, because, because I, I have so many great year. opportunities to grow and learn from people who have some really different choice between varying levels of restriction on my life, and not having a life, is not a choice. It is the foundation for mechanisms by which people and systems can control me. It doesn't always work. Like when I believe the harms to disabled people outweigh the risk of burning the bridges needed to build change. Returning to my example, when the lack of services, the devaluation, and disregard for my safety and survival have risen above the benefits of support, then external forces have lost their leverage. As is the case now, I believe I have enough support to get through the risks. My immediate survival is more stable and I can take meaningful risks to ensure people whose survival is on the line are seen. We cannot repeat history with the institutionalization and shifts toward quote-unquote independence. Being independent is not unconditionally good when the reality is being unsupported and ending up in other institutions when what is needed is adequate support for disabled people instead of being mislabeled as difficult and being arrested, hospitalized, or dying. Okay, so those are some some pretty powerful words from from Tristan, um, and pretty inspiring to it's an inspiring way to get around some disability by uh, sharing uh, through text to voice. Um, and next, uh, we have on the topic of rural inclusion and peer support, uh, Anita Carter Rose. Uh, Anita is a first voice speaker. Uh, who is retired from the Department of National Defense. She is co-founder and peer support specialist uh, with Eastern uh, Shore Mental Health. Anita? Thank you. Thank you, Sean. And good morning, everyone. And I really appreciate the invitation to speak this morning. Uh, so, yeah, so um, from the rural perspective, uh, the topic of rural... Um, the rural funding for mental health and addictions um, is very important uh, for a number of reasons, and I will take a few minutes to cover those, starting with noting that the Eastern Shore is lumped in as um, Halifax Regional Municipality when it actually spans 5,400 square meters, and the urban area is only 238. We are the 14th largest munici municipality in all of Canada. So too often, rural HRM is neglected when it comes to mental health and addiction funding disbursements. For example, we have one mental health and addictions worker for three hospitals in our region. We have social workers that are also shared between the hospitals of our region. Another example, is our small community-based group, um, Eastern Shore Mental Health. For the past 15 years, we have operated solely on donations and grants to offer emergency housing, crisis intervention, private professional therapy, transportation and food allowance, peer support, grief and loss therapy, navigation of mental health and addiction services, and programs and services to improve self-help and build resilience in people living with mental health challenges and addictions. 
peer support has actually proven to be very effective. It eases the burden on the public healthcare system. It is often free, it's local, and it's easy. So that being said, over the last 15 years, we've worked very closely with, on donations and grant money only, with the other community-based services in our region. And that is professional people, but it's also um, the things like Lions Clubs and things like that. And so we've done all this without any federal funding. And so on that, I would like to ask Dr. Hickox, what would he do to ensure that this rural, um, the increased rural funding for mental health and addictions is included in the policy and strategy moving forward? Thank you. Thanks, Anita. Um, okay, so we have growing importance of recognizing that uh, rural HRM is getting treated differently perhaps than some other uh, areas of HRM. Um, we wanna make sure that that doesn't fall through the cracks. Um, next, uh, we have uh, Ryan Gould on the topic of indigenous mental health. Uh, Ryan is a first voice speaker and is the president of the Member Two Men's Society. Okay, thank you all for uh, having me speak at this, uh, you know, such an amazing event and um, getting these conversations started. And it's amazing what I'm hearing so far. So thank you for that. Uh, my name is Ryan Gould. I'm the president of the Member Two Men's Society, which is a nonprofit organization. We started about four years ago. Um, it was me and a group of childhood friends from the community of Member Two, and um, we just wanted to, uh, you know, provide or more or less navigate, but try our best to provide support and services for Indigenous, non-Indigenous men of all ages, not only from Member Two but surrounding communities as well. Just because, um, you know, us learning of the lack of support for men in, in all local areas. Um, <clears throat> What uh, led to the starting of this uh, group and, and starting this support was uh, myself losing my, uh, my four daughters at the time to child services and struggling with uh, alcohol and cocaine addiction. So in the process of trying to become a healthier father and, and, and getting, um, you know, battling these addictions, uh, I learned of the lack of support for men. So uh, Upon getting sober and building enough courage, I, um, I, I just wanted to kind of um, ensure that other men coming along behind me would, would have an easier time in uh, uh, receiving the proper professional supports and services. And um, also, you know, the tools to become healthier, more loving, supportive fathers, um, healthier partners, and uh, in return, this, this would help with the, uh, you know, the, the murdered and missing indigenous women and men. And uh, we kind of complete that circle in our, our families and in our community, because we always had support for elders, support for children and women, which was amazing. But if we had all of our, our uh, the components of a family healthy and, and the men weren't well, um, you know, it, it's just a matter of time before, uh, you know, things um, catch up to them. Um, the other reason was, um, you know, I, 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 I had a lot of loss um, over the years um, because of uh, issues such as addictions, mental health and grief. So I've lost pretty much all of my close childhood friends and uh, a lot of family members to things like uh, murder, overdose and suicide and um, just really wanted to, um, yeah, I, I just wanted to create this, this safe, inclusive space for men to be able to, uh, we wanted to break the stigma of, of men not being able to express their emotions or their traumas or what they're going through without being labeled or, or seen as vulnerable and weak. And um, as a result of that and, and being uh, accepted and able to, to speak of the supports that we need or, or feel we can benefit from, we're able to um, build the lives that we deserve for ourselves and our family. 
and, um, and, and thrive in the community. Um, so yeah, we just kind of do, um, you know, we do charity, charitable fundraisers. We, um, host, uh, community events and we, we try to focus on preserving our culture by doing, um, activities with the youth and, uh, making an attempt to, uh, break that cycle. So, um, yeah, I, I have a question here in closing. So in, in my experience, utilizing professional supports and services can be extremely effective for indigenous communities to address issues such as addictions, mental health, grief, and, and poverty caused by intergenerational trauma, this being a result of the residential schools. Another effective approach in addressing issues amongst our local communities is working collectively to create peer support programs focusing on building connection and support for parents, men and young boys, women and young girls, various youth groups and elders, et cetera. So my question is, what will government do to ensure that all of these issues discussed are included in policy and strategy moving forward? Thank you very much. Thanks, Ryan. Um, Next, we have uh, Aaliyah Campbell on the topic of uh, Black Indigenous people of color mental health. Um, Aaliyah is a social worker with the Association of Black Social Workers. Uh, over to you, Aaliyah. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak. I'm happy to be here on, the, on behalf of the Association of Black Social Workers. In my role as the outreach social worker at ABSW, I have noticed a number of barriers to mental health care among African Nova Scotians. I want to preface by acknowledging that stigma is a problem, but it does not tell the whole story and it does not exist in a vacuum. Historically, medical racism has deterred Black people from discussing mental health openly and seeking support. Well-established examples of medical racism in Canada include health professionals dismissing, invalidating, and minimizing patient concerns, victim blaming and pathologizing patients, and refusing to provide services. These traumatic and negative experiences deter future engagements with the healthcare system. Naturally, many of my clients rightfully feel unsafe seeking white therapists as these practitioners have racial biases that are not conducive to healing or wellness. Mental health services are in high demand, um, particularly from Black providers. So contrary to what is commonly thought, poor help-seeking behavior among Black people is not the primary issue that I'm finding here. Service barriers are far more salient. Many of the Black therapists that I have spoken to are overburdened. Um, high caseloads and long wait lists are common. In my attempt to make client referrals, many Black therapists have told me outright that they are unable to accept new clients due to the high demand for an already limited number of Black therapists locally. Uh, commuting for mental health services is also extremely costly. I'm sure those of you in HRM know that toll increases on the bridge in Halifax just recently increased, and this makes it even more inaccessible for people in and around Dartmouth to access mental health services in Halifax. This change is now compounded with skyrocketing gas prices, which acutely affects people who need to drive longer distances from the rural areas that many African Nova Scotians call home. Many therapists operate on a weekly or biweekly basis, which would, would compel people to commute regularly for these services. This requirement is out of reach for many African Nova Scotians. In most of rural Nova Scotia, where many Black communities are concentrated, there is no, limited to no public transit at all. For example, in East Preston, the increasingly exp expensive bus service runs every two hours and ends on weekends. Also, income inequality and the racial wage gap are another barrier to mental health services. According to a report, a report from the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, Black women earned an average of $31,000 and Black men earned an average income of $37,000 in 2015. To put this into perspective, Black women earned 83, 83 cents for every dollar that white women earned that same year, while Black men earned 66 cents for every dollar that white men earned. Furthermore, Black people are overrepresented in precarious work. 
This sector offers limited to no benefits, and without benefits that cover or offset therapy costs, it is extremely difficult for many African Nova Scotians to access costly care. Therapists in Nova Scotia typically charge between $100 to $160. Even on a sliding scale at hourly rates of $80 to $90, um, services are out of reach for many African Nova Scotians. Um, finally, I want to note that poor mental health literally kills. Left untreated, it can cause premature biological aging and death. Racial weathering is a concept that refers to at the adverse health effects of the accumulation of racial stress over an extended period of time. Researchers posit that frequent discriminatory experiences result in high stress levels in the long term, which, subse which subsequently engenders early health deterioration and many chronic diseases such as cancer, hypertension and heart disease, stroke, and premature death. The government of Nova Scotia has the power to address some of these gaps and promote the health of African Nova Scotians. I would ask that the government promote capacity building by funding the provision of mental health services in trusted community organizations like the Association of Black Social Workers. This would allow us to hire one or two of the highly qualified Black therapists in the area and create office space for free therapy sessions. Thank you. Thank you, Aaliyah. Um, next, uh, we have uh, Dr. Katrina Brown on the topic of uh, social determ psychosocial determinants of health. Um, Dr. Brown is a uh, social work professor uh, with Dalhousie University. Hi, I think um, that you have a PowerPoint that you need to put up, but you don't have to because I can just, yeah, okay. Um, all right, so I'm going to talk about, um, or I'm going to argue at least, that social workers are, are all dressed up with nowhere to go. Um, so it should become clear what I mean by those words. Um, based on my research study, uh, Repositioning Social Work Practice in Mental Health in Nova Scotia, and that's available through the college. It, it's really clear, um, and it just echoes everything that everyone else has been saying, that social workers are experiencing a kind of moral distress, um, and especially in rural areas, as the current approach to mental health provision is failing to meet uh, needed services. Our report argues that the development of alternative and decentralized biopsychosocial approaches um, are necessary in order to recognize the social determinants of mental health. Just, um, just a few things that are dramatic in our findings from the people that we talked to. 98% of the social workers believed, 98%, that there needs to be changes made to the current provision of mental health services. 96% noticed that we experience barriers to providing services, uh, which includes a lack of resources also what other people have been saying. 97% did not believe that there were adequate resources in the community to support the well-being of their clients. 85% believe there were not adequate day programs or services available within the community. 82% report that their social work training and social justice perspectives are not recognized in the current system. 71% of social workers also said that they don't have an opportunity to actually use an anti-oppressive social justice-based approach to mental health because the system does not address social determinants of mental health. So it's not surprising then that 30, only 35% were satisfied with their current, with their current role. So services are limited then by the policies of fiscal constraint. I mean, there's a deliberate decision to not invest money in mental health and substance use problems. And of course that needs to change. The result of it is that we can see a very prescriptive use of short-term strategies and a standardization of approaches that are quite focused on a strict biomedical framework, which causes the work to be very symptom focused. And it also results in streamlined individualized one size fits all approaches, which again, disregard social determinants of mental health. 
um, really importantly, is the inadequate time available to develop client-centered care and form therapeutic relationships, which all research shows is the most significant determinant of positive outcomes once you start working with somebody, more than the type of approach used. The development of programs that can um, address the complexity of the relationship between mental health, substance use, trauma, intergenerational trauma is critically important. Treatment can't be all segregated and fragmented. And this work cannot be done in six to eight sessions. It just cannot. And this is the kind of time frame that is often um, imposed. The current implementation of the CAPA model as a delivery model is really failing due to these constraints, which is the lack of resources as identified, lack of consultation with community and lack of diversity, the need for more community-based programs, and lengthy, lengthy wait times with limited access. Also points other people have made. A couple of things some of the participants said, everything is controlled from the top down, what real clients are facing are never taken into account. The Nova Scotia Health Authority is driven not by people first model, but by fiscal constraints and workers within the system suffer moral distress as a result. Or social justice, that's not driving this, not real people. Efficiency is driving this, the factory model. Needless to say, social workers are frustrated. So a couple of summary sort of recommendations, and there are many in the report, we need to prioritize the mental health and well-being of Nova Scotians. And the first way they, that we do that is through infusing significant funding. Uh, and that shows the commitment into mental health. But it's not just the funding. It's also a radical restructuring of how the mental health services in the province are provided. Part of that involves re-examining the CAPA framework and its tiered approach and the strict focus on biopsychosocial models. Clearly from everything anybody has said so far, we need to address the actual social context and realities of people's lives. That involves then addressing the social inequalities in mental health and addiction services themselves. And it need, we need to actually develop, develop and offer community and culturally appropriate and specific services to African Nova Scotians, Indigenous communities, queer communities, women, dis, uh, communities of disability and other identified groups based on consultation, which is critical. It's not just imposed from the top. I'm just trying to... Um, and also we need to decentralize the services, which means move them outside of just hospitals and government into the community, uh, more peer-led supports and so on. In other words, try to provide a, a more options, greater choice, greater accessibility within the community. And inside that kind of greater choice approach, I would like to say that we really need to emphasize the coexisting relationship between relational injury, trauma, mental health, and substance use. Um, that connection is super, super common. It, it, the fragmentation that exists around program delivery is really uh, inadequate. And uh, as to the point made earlier about addiction services taking a deep erosion, um, in the effort to collaborate mental health and addiction, addiction just disappeared. Uh, that has to be thought out. The programming has to be developed. People need to be trained. Um, and then we need to contextualize um, mental health programming uh, through community consultation and collaboration. Um, and really what I'm saying there is whatever mental health strategies are developed by this government, we need to ensure that those strategies actually align with the needs of real people. And we need to reposition social workers themselves within the mental health care and addiction services. Um, in order to sort of reflect our social justice-based education and training, um, in order for social workers to actually do their job, in other words, to not be all dressed up with nowhere to go, we have to be able to recognize the social determinants of mental health and thereby uh, provide better services. Uh, so, Dr. Brown, Dr. Brown, yeah, I hear, I hear your passion for the topic, but I am keeping track of time. 
So if maybe we want to move. I'm in conclusion. I have just two sentences left. Great. <laughs> um, so, so the findings are consistent with the words of the people today. They're consistent with international and national findings. And really, ultimately, what I have just presented from this report is it's a combination of the fiscal constraint, the lack of money, and the biomedical focus, which is a product of that in part. It sets up mental health and substance use delivery systems at, to fail. Uh, partly by denying social determinants and realities of people's lives. So we have to provide mental health care that does address the adverse life experiences, such as trauma, violence, relational injury, racism, sexism, homophobia, disability, intergenerational trauma, colonization, marginalization, oppression, poverty, homelessness, and inequity. All of that has to be addressed. And social workers are the best people um, positioned to be able to provide those services. That's it. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Um, uh, yes, I see the, the question from, from Jim there. Dr. Hickox has finally come. Um, I think what I'll do before I, I introduce you, yeah, I, I see that, that's fantastic. I, I think um, Dr. Hickox, what I'll do is I'll, I'll keep moving through the, the rest of the, uh, the community uh, commentaries and then I'll, I'll give sort of a, an overview of what has happened perhaps in the time that you were gone. Uh, and uh, we'll move into the Q&A portion or your remarks and your remarks, and we'll just combine them into one if that's okay with you. Um, so next uh, we have here uh, Todd Leader, who is a social worker, community psychologist, public sector leader and university faculty member amongst other things. Todd, over to you. Uh, you're muted, Todd. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you're good. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. So universal access is my topic. Uh, so, you know, simply put, what universal access means is that everybody has equal access. And I think it's equal as opposed to equitable, actually, in this case. Uh, this was a major focus of my work prior to 2016 when I left the healthcare system, but I, I was fortunate enough to work with a team that actually managed to transform the addiction and mental health system and, uh, and create this kind of access. Uh, and then I subsequently wrote about it in a book. So I'm going to be giving you a, about a four minute uh, brief summary of a lot of what's in that book. But so if we think about what equal access means, what universal access means, we have to look at what are, what are the actual barriers that we have to get rid of. Many people have alluded to some of those or addressed some of those along the way so far today. But geography is one, you know, we have, because our mental health and our addiction mental health systems are in, uh, embedded within healthcare, they are embedded within an institutional model. And so therefore we tend to build and, and centralize all of our services within that kind of framework instead of decentralizing. And geographical access is a major, major barrier for people. So whether that's in rural areas or the outskirts of urban areas, uh, it's a major area because of a major problem because of transportation costs, a number of other issues. So we need to decentralize. Uh, we need to recognize that our system is not universal if it does not provide um, if it does not provide for services appropriate for all tiers or all levels of need, well, that means that we can't have a system like we do right now that just waits for people to be sick enough because that's what we have. We have a crisis response kind of system. You have to be sick enough in order to get service. And, and we will never dig our way out of this hole if we don't create services that are made for people who are not yet really sick, who are not diagnosable, but are having early symptoms of things that will eventually progress to being illness. Addiction and mental illness are progressive illnesses. So we need to create earlier intervention so that people at all levels of health and illness have a place to go that is appropriate. Otherwise, we're not providing care to the whole population. Uh, cultural relevance and safety has been mentioned a couple of times. That's a huge one. And so that's about how we design the kinds of services and the kinds of uh, um, structures, the kinds of processes and who it is that we hire providing those services and where are they provided. Again, all of those things affect the issue of, of culture. And uh, 
And, you know, peer support is one way to, uh, I see the comment there, that, and thank you, Tristan, for that. Peer support is, uh, you know, peer support and paraprofessional services are perfect for the lower tiers and for, and for many tiers of the kinds of needs that we have. We need to stop adher adhering to the, bio, to the medical model solely. We need to start to think from a biopsychosocial perspective because uh, the causes of the problems we're dealing with are varied. They are not all medical. And, and biopsychosocial does include medical, but people who adhere to the medical model tend to see it as competition, and that's just flawed thinking. Um, so uh, Blair talked about day detox. Day detox is a perfect model, but not if there are no beds available for those who actually require beds. Uh, so again, going too extreme in one direction. Financial access is a huge one. Uh, and so this is about our two-tiered system. We have a two-tiered system. If people who have money have better access because they can pay for, for private. Now, I know that Tim Houston promised, uh, it, one of his promises was that uh, we would end up with the ability to have uh, private practitioners bill MSI as the same as physicians do. Hopefully that will happen. The bottom line is one size doesn't fit all. And Sean, I am watching the time here, so I'm, I will be finished. Uh, one size doesn't fit all, not even in t-shirts. It's, it's, a, it's a flawed concept. And so the more we create services that are systematized and rigid, and you know, this is the box, this is who this is for, the, the, the less we provide access, universal access. Uh, we need a client-centered system, not just client-centered care. Those are very, very different concepts. The last point I'll make is the government needs to stop listening to the Nova Scotia Health Authority and the IWK because they have failed to fix the system thus far. Why would we think they have the answers now? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Todd. Um, and uh, next, uh, we have a recording from uh, Carmel uh, Farabaksh. Uh, she is, or they are the, uh, the executive director of the Youth Project, and they are going to share a message about community organizations to provide wraparound services. Hi, my name is Carmel Farahbash. My pronouns are they and them, and I'm the executive director of the Youth Project. I'm really happy to be here with you all virtually. Um, for folks that are not aware, the Youth Project is a non-for-profit charitable organization that works provincially to provide supports for 2S LGBTQIA plus uh, uh, youth. And we have a kind of a three-pronged strategy that utilizes advocacy, education, and social services and peer support as a way to engage with youth um, through a programming lens and context. Um, so I'm really happy to be here with you today to talk about the importance of collaboration and the, the crucial element of de-siloing the work that we do within community, especially around mental health. Um, I believe that mental health needs to be collaborative, to be truly holistic, uh, and truly meet our community's wide and diverse needs. Um, so I think specifically when we think about collaborative work, uh, that means that the nonprofit sector is seen as community leaders uh, within the field of, uh, of mental health and wellness, just as you are, uh, and seen as peers in this work. And I think that there's so much that we can learn from each other through our contexts, uh, either a frontline work or more policy based work um, that can support our visions towards building the future that we deserve. Um, and so I think if we look at the social determinants of health, uh, for example, like access to housing or access to financial stability, um, we think about those elements of our world as so crucial. And we see provincially and municipally that through contexts like a housing crisis, that there are so many folks that need access to uh, ba like basic supports to have their needs met. And that's where I think collaboration is so vital. And um, there's ways to collaborate to create a holistic mental health framework where folks can have their immediate needs met and also collaborate with a variety of caregivers in a framework which allows for that person or those people to have access to support on multiple fronts. Um, and we can really then utilize our power within our offices, within our organizations to use that collaborative power, to use that collaborative effort to allow folks to have access to um, 
something like a culturally relevant model of support that also understands the intersections of their identities and understands the intersections of systemic oppression that, that have created the situation that they may be in. So again, when we look at our collaborative models, we want to hold this beautiful and important approach that allows for all of our modalities and frameworks to uh, combine so that we can provide the most relevant resource possible. Um, so again, really excited for this future, really excited to continue collaborating and to make new partnerships and build new partnerships so that we can, again, build the world that we deserve. Okay, um, next uh, we have uh, Serena Lewis uh, on the topic of uh, community resources to address collective trauma. Serena is a registered social worker and grief trauma advocate. Uh, she authored the Nova Scotia Provincial Grief Strategy. She lives and supports communities in rural Nova Scotia who experienced the mass casualty event in April 2020. Thank you, Sean. I appreciate the invitation today to participate in the critical dialogue that I'm hearing from everyone. I would like to start by acknowledging that collective trauma requires collective healing and that healing needs to be proactive. It needs to be evidence informed and diverse. It also needs to be embedded within community where our individuals and our families work and live. It requires capital C culture and lowercase c culture, rural, informed and accessible. I know that talking about death is a diff difficult topic, and I really believe grief and trauma has become about the same. We are not a grief and trauma-informed literate pro province, and that dramatically needs to change. We have been and we are witnessing a multitude of losses in our province. We could go on about those from an economic, social, physical lens. Uh, they're very diverse. We also know, and I'm going to identify some uh, because I think they're very important, but that's not to minimize other losses that we've recognized. We know that we have rising numbers of babies being found in graves and ongoing missing and murdered Indigenous women. We know that multiple deaths have occurred in this province through COVID and other illness related ways, even over the last two years that have been incredibly isolative for families around rituals and beliefs that they typically have. Those deaths have occurred in homes, long-term care settings, and acute care settings across our province. Many of these have had delayed responses for attention and support due to all of the pandemic restrictions. Other losses that have and are requiring support that could have been and need to be before, during, and after are our medical assisted deaths that occur in this province, as well as suicides and overdoses. There is a before, during, and after response that is needed for those families and individuals. I also pay attention to the multiple accidents and tragedies that have occurred across our province and the increasing attention to violent gun-related deaths that have now become part of our Nova Scotia narrative. I am a professional who lives and works in rural Nova Scotia in the epicenter of the port -Pic mass shooting. I have been appalled by the lack of coordinated long-term response that has increasingly been reflected in our media that has now batted the topic of trauma and trauma-formed practices around and confused people. Tragedies and losses are now part of this, and I think it's important that the isolation, poverty, and the rural fractured communities that are currently being inundated with 1-800 numbers, 211 recommendations, and we've become a province that's filled with navigation, but in many ways we're sending people in circles. We know and understand the impacts of trauma. They're very well and richly written about in evidence. And we also know that trauma begets more trauma and when not addressed with skilled diverse supports in our communities, they have actual long-term impact, uh, impacts. We need proactive supports that mitigate mental illnesses and occurrences of PTSD. These things can be done proactively and even in a harm reduction way. I was proud to co-author a provincial grief strategy in Nova Scotia when I worked with Nova Scotia Health, uh, the health system in 2020. I asked our government why two years later that still has not been actualized. The grief strategy does not. And there has been lots of evidence that it would be regionally supported across our province. 
We know that we all share in the impacts of grief and trauma. There's no one on this call that hasn't been touched by it. This province has been brought to its knees. I'm tired of being called Nova Scotia strong. I know that we have the insight, the resources, and the skills to elevate the needs to become an epicenter of collective healing. I ask everyone, which identity do we want to proceed with at this junction in time? The epicenter of losses, tragedy, and trauma, or the epicenter of health, healing, and cultural strength? Thank you. Thank you so much, Serena. Um, so we're, we're at the point in the agenda where we were scheduled to have uh, the Q&A, but I think what I'll do is I'll just briefly go over, um, not the questions, but just the overall themes, perhaps of the speakers that you've uh, missed, Dr. Hickox. And then I'll have you um, perhaps say, uh, an ab abbreviated version of whatever your opening remarks will be, and then we'll have you respond to uh, the, uh, the, the various topics that were brought up, if that's okay. I can't see you here, so I'm not sure where, where you're at, but um, so I'll, I'll just, uh, okay, great, there you are. Um, I'll, I'll just go over briefly just, and my apologies to the uh, contributors earlier on if I'm not doing your, your words justice, but bear with me. So first we, we started off uh, looking at uh, the cuts that have been seen in rural areas and the, the lack of withdrawal, resport, withdrawal um, supports in the addictions community. And then uh, we heard about the, um, the medical necessity of inpatient detox beds and the, the cuts that were seen there. Um, and also the value of 21, 28 day residential treatment programs um, and how those are distinct really from the inpatient uh, detox beds and, and long-term residential uh, treatment. Uh, and also the importance of consultation when you're considering cutting resources in different areas as well, not just adding, but also cutting. Um, and then we also heard about the, uh, the, the branching negative effects of uh, a lack of support in the community um, and uh, the spiraling of costs when uh, support is not available. Uh, and then we heard from Tristan about the intersectionality between disability, homelessness, and, and mental, mental illness. Um, and we, we heard uh, some more about uh, rural Nova Scotia and uh, rural HRM uh, in the Eastern Shore and how it's often neglected because it's lumped in with the rest of HRM and yet it's a very rural area uh, by nature with only 200, uh, 200 square kilometers of urban space versus 5,000 kilometers of, of coastline. Um, and so there we have, you know, uh, mental health professionals spread thin uh, between uh, institutions that are sharing them. Um, and then we heard from Ryan about uh, uh, his experiences with the uh, Indigenous, uh, the Member Two Men's Society, um, and the the lack of support that he was finding when he was coming through uh, for men struggling with addictions, and how uh, his role uh, or he saw it important to create a space where you know you could break the stigma around asking for help and support when you need it. So uh, you know, being talking about breaking the labels of being labeled uh, weak or um, uh, when facing addictions and, and also the, uh, the um, how a healthy family really has knock-on effects throughout the entire community, uh, even with big issues like murdered and missing Indigenous uh, women. Um, uh, did you, were you around for Aaliyah's, uh, Aaliyah's comments, uh, Dr. Hickox? Okay, so there uh, she was talking about um, BIPOC interactions with the health system. Um, and how negative interactions with the health system can then lead to less engagement with that health system and distrust with that health system. And the negative interaction can stem from, uh, you know, <laughs> denial or uh, racist or, or traumatic experiences dealing with uh, professionals. Um, and then we have a, a also a lack of, as I'm sure you're aware, a lack of representation in the mental health professions more broadly. Um, and that the few, uh, in this case, she brought up uh, black clinicians who are overburdened. They have extremely long wait lists. And just from my personal experience, I know that they're engaged beyond what their work would be normally uh, trying to address uh, equity issues. And then there's also the inaccessibility of costs that goes along with that. 
Um, and I think you were here for Dr. Dr. Brown's remarks, right? Okay, so that 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 brings us up to uh, the point where you've had the opportunity. So now I'll, I'll turn it over to you. We've got about uh, let's see, we've got about we'll say fifteen minutes. We'll say fifteen minutes, and, and I'll let you use the time as as you will. And thank you for joining. My deepest apologies for being late today. Um, I had some. Uh, uh, issues with my with both of my computer devices today so uh i was uh, struggling for about an hour to get to get myself up and running and i do deeply apologize i'm working from home today as you can probably tell right now unfortunately i don't have surfboards in the back i just have a guitar so sorry about that sean it's really an honor to be here um and a privilege for me and i just want to really appreciate the effort and work that folks have put into this in acknowledgement of the fact that I didn't uh, have an opportunity to uh, <clears throat> be here for the whole uh, for the whole uh, time, um, for those who I didn't actually have a chance to hear directly from, I would offer the opportunity to uh, reach out to each of you and have a brief conversation and just to sort of hear a little bit from each of your uh, directly from each of you who I didn't <clears throat> actually get to hear from. I think that that would be really important, okay? And uh, I guess in the spirit of restorative justice, it would be a it would be a, uh, in <clears throat> acknowledgement of the fact that uh, uh, you know there there is some uh, well I wouldn't say harm, but anyway some loss uh, that happens when uh, thing when unfortunately we have to summarize. So um, <clears throat> so I have um, I guess I guess uh, I'm going to ask whoever's organizing that today if you want to send out um, like a list of email uh, addresses for the people that I didn't hear from. And we I can each work out. out we will be out. happy <laughs> to help you connect. Thank you so okay. much. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it's it's really no problem. So I don't know if uh, y'all know like who I am exactly, but I'm a, I'm a, uh, I actually come from away I'm originally from uh, my family's from the States and I grew up partially in this small town in Ontario called uh, Toronto. You may have heard of that place. And I also grew up uh, partially overseas in the Middle East as well as in uh, the United Kingdom. So I uh, sort of was in my, my, my youth uh, subject to a significant uh, sort of exposure to, to what it means to live in a completely different cultural context, which I think is part of, part of what shaped who I am. And I also am someone who uh, in my own, my own uh, family kind of circle, there were significant mental health challenges growing up uh, and a lot of childhood trauma. Um, and that certainly has informed uh, sort of the direction that I took. Uh, originally was actually another regulated healthcare profession. I was a massage therapist for about seven years in Toronto, which is a regulated healthcare profession and taught at the community college level and then decided to go back uh, to school. I went to medical school later in life which of course I think allows me to sort of incorporate perhaps a more broad perspective about what it means to live in the real world before entering into medical school. So, and I was always drawn to mental health and, and uh, uh, you know, that kind of work. And so for the last 15 years in very di various different ways, I've worked in a number of, number of uh, areas and mostly with the Nova Scotia Health Authority. Um, in addition, I would say that uh, for about eight to 10 years, uh, I, I got uh, exposed to what it meant to work uh, uh, with folks living with significant substance use disorders and uh, really found my home there as a clinician. And so for the last 10 years, and to this day, I continue to do some clinical work with uh, folks who, uh, who live with addiction. And uh, that, that's sort of an area of passion of mine. Um, and, uh, and then uh, for some reason, uh, folks decided that it would be a good idea to sort of offer me this job as the chief of the, of the new office of addictions and mental health. So, um, <clears throat> so, you know, for me, it's like, and I, and I have this weird, like cultural studies degree from Trent university, which is like a very bizarre thing to have before you go to medical school. So, you know, I, I sort of am someone who, you know, historically, uh, worked as an activist in various kind of, uh, roles, uh, Mostly it's sort of anti-racism activism and environmental activism used to work for Greenpeace as well. And so, I, you know, I'm someone who I think, uh, you know, I wouldn't say you're preaching to the choir because I wouldn't presume that. But, you know, a lot of what is, uh, you know, being spoken of and certainly, you know, our, 
meetings with the Nova Scotia College previously, a lot of it really resonates with sort of the perspective that I think really needs to happen with respect to a sort of non-biomedical approach, right, to mental health care provision. And, and, I, and I lump addiction care provision in with mental health uh, 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 care as well, because addiction, although there are some particular facets to it, it's really, you know, it's just, they're just other, other um, sort of mental health challenges. Um, so, yeah, so, so I just want to say that, you know, a lot of what's being said really resonates with me. Um, I also have had a lot of experience inside the leadership of Nova Scotia Health Authority's mental health and addictions program. And now, of course, with government. So I have that bias, right? Like where I've sort of been, you know, for like six years, I've been at leadership tables, right? With people who are really trying to make that mental health addiction system better. So, you know, rightly or wrongly, right? Uh, I do sort of have some you know, uh, some sense that there are a lot of, you know, well-intentioned people, right? Um, I think one of the things that happens, and I'm sure that many of you would appreciate this, is that, you know, structurally, right, structurally, it's very difficult to affect change in a large organization like Nova Scotia Health. And, and um, I think that that's where often things fall short, you know, in my experience is uh, it's either because uh, it's um, processes over people, policies that are really, <clears throat> you know, well-intentioned to reduce risk and and uh, but sometimes that means reducing risk to the organization and sometimes there's a lack of courage a lack of you know ability to sort of take risks uh, in the interest of actually uh, people um, and and uh, you know so it's it's sort of like trying to turn an enormous cruise ship around it takes a long time right um, I'm not saying that to make an excuse. I'm just sort of, that's been my observation working with that large institution for the last uh, five to six years at that leadership level. So, you know, there are, I think a lot of folks who, you know, working in the system who would really, uh, you know, see things very similarly in terms of the need for uh, uh, there to be uh, a client-centered system versus just offering client-centered care. But it, it, you know, it's, I, I think it's sometimes structurally very difficult to do that. And uh, I think that that's in part the intention, not entirely, but in part the intention of the universal mental health care uh, uh, mandate item that uh, has been brought forward, which, you know, in, includes offering uh, the ability for social workers uh, clinical psychologists, registered counseling therapists, and other healthcare professionals to actually bill MSI privately, regardless of where they work. And I think that, you know, in part, it's to say, look, you know, there's a whole health human resource out there that's working privately that people can really only access based on their ability to pay, right? And that that's essentially runs in con uh, in contradistinction uh, from, you know, what the, what the health, uh, the, you know, the Canada, the, the health, the health act would, would stipulate, which is that, you know, healthcare should be available to all and that mental health care is essential, is, is, is an essential component of mental health, of, of healthcare itself. And, uh, and so I think that there's some great opportunity there to, to really be thinking outside the box and to be much more flexible in our approach, right? But with that said, there's a lot that could be done wrong. And in particular, um, it would be very easy to sort of erase the experience of people with lived experience of mental health, those who are BIPOC, those who would identify themselves as 2SLGBT, uh, GBTQ, 1A+, plus, um, uh, those who are Indigenous and not only are seeking equity in the way that other racialized groups are, but also have a particular relationship as a nation, right, to, uh, to, to Canada itself. So, you know, there's, uh, and as well as those who are youth, uh, uh, who are who are between the age of 15 and 29, and and rural Nova Scotians. So, you know, from uh, from my point of view, we really have to be thinking about all of the all all of these uh, facets, like when we're when we're trying to really expand our notion of what um, a mental health care system is about. Right. I would also say that you know one of the one of the um, very important sort of directions that I want to go with in our healthcare system and mental health uh, care overall in Nova Scotia would be to um, really change the conversation that we are having about mental health care as a culture. Um, I think that the stigma that's associated with mental uh, illness as well as um, 
the uh, destigmatizing effects of the opioid crisis actually um, have have actually led us to be in a very different place than we were even a decade decade and a half ago, and uh, that's even reflected in. Uh, I can I can tell you my experience as as someone who does a lot of uh, ed education for uh, for residents who are training to be family physicians and psychiatrists that the number of um, residents who are actually interested in addiction care and actually asking to come and train with us um, has uh, increased by approximately tenfold compared to a decade ago and I think that there, there's a growing you know understanding that these are actually health problems and not uh, characterological flaws, moral failings, or criminal uh, or criminal activities, right? And you know that that's very true for the addiction world, but also true for the mental health world. So there's you know much more. I think there's a greater willingness to talk about mental health, to talk about how we're all doing. That certainly was an important part of the public narrative that we've we've seen um, over the last two years with respect to the pandemic, and the impact that it's having on mental health. But with that said. I think there's a there's a misunderstanding of what uh, mental illness is versus uh, those experiencing significant mental distress. Um, there's a lack of understanding of actually what is required to really uh, help people along. And I think that probably most people here would agree with me that what we need um, amongst all the, you know, if we think about formal mental health care practitioners who work within Nova Scotia Health or outside of it, in private practice, those who work at IWK, etc. Um, we also need to deprofessionalize the notion of what it means to provide treatment or care for those who live with uh, either significant mental distress, you know, they're suffering and miserable, or and or have a diagnosis of a mental illness. So um, what, what I mean by that is, we, is the conversation needs to move towards um, a collective sense of responsibility for each other within communities to care for each other and to reach out. Um, in my view, you know, when I think about, you know, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not going to uh, put rose colored glasses on and say that the response to uh, the port of peak uh, mass casualty event has been wonderful and beautiful and perfect, right? So agreed that there's much that can be done. But the notion that communities, um, people in the community can care for each other and, and share this pain, share this burden, as opposed to each person individually trying to, trying to take care of themselves, take care of their own well being as an individual, that's actually the way forward. We need to find ways to establish collective responses. To, uh, to mental health uh, challenges. I think otherwise what we're gonna end up with is a mental health uh, system where you have a bunch of people who are trying to access professionals who, um, where you're, it's always a limited resource, right? And then you're going to have um, people trying to do self-management on their own as individuals, you know, meditation, mindfulness, um, uh, you know, self-help books, et cetera, et cetera, uh, changing their diet, doing their exercise, which are all really important things for people's resilience and well-being. But what's missing there is really a collective communal community sense of resilience. And I think that that's, that's where we need to look for opportunities to think about what's the intersection between community and communities and, um, and our mental well-being. We live in a society in which we spend too much time on our phones, too much time chasing the dragon of online um, shopping. Uh, we're surrounded uh, by concrete, in con living in concrete boxes, and uh, we're disconnected from each other, right? So, you know, to use a Marxist term, uh, we're alienated from each other. And uh, I, I think that that's, that's actually what we really need to overcome is rather than really buy into a very individualistic notion of what the solutions to mental health challenges are. We need to find ways to inspire people to actually collectively work together and respond uh, to, uh, to mental distress that's happening in the community, right? And that doesn't mean that there isn't a role for formal mental health uh, uh, clinicians at all, but I think that that's part of the conversation change that really needs to happen.
right? So one of the examples that I often present to people to sort of illustrate this, like an opportunity for something that really to inspire a different way of thinking about things is a project that was developed uh, in uh, uh, Zimbabwe, um, <clears throat> in which uh, their, the ratio of psychiatrists to population is about one in a million. So for every million Zimbabweans, there's one psychiatrist. And, uh, you know, I would hazard a guess that uh, we would see a similar, very poor ratios with respect to um, other mental health, uh, you know, clinicians or clinicians who provide mental health care. And so uh, one of the uh, one of the hospitals actually started this project and it sort of expanded beyond the, pro beyond the hospital grounds, but it started with setting up benches, okay, throughout, uh, uh, throughout Harare, I believe it was. And um, the benches were kind of designated places that people could, uh, would, would be able to identify that as a certain color, everybody, it was publicized and, and advertised. And sitting on the bench, each bench was a grandmother, right? And the, that, that's what was required is you, you, to be qualified to, to sit there uh, as, a, as a helper, you had to be a grandmother, that was your qualification. Then you got some basic training and triaging, risk, risk management and so on, like what to do with, you know, and how to get people referred to more, you know, who are in crisis and those kind of things. But really what it was, was a place for people to come and sit on the bench anonymously and just talk to a grandmother, right? And uh, get advice, get support, maybe get some love, right? To feel heard and respected and understood. And um, I think, you know, like, and, and, to, and it was, it's, it's been a, a great success, okay? And I think that part of what it does is it actually changes our notion of really what mental health care needs to be. You know, uh, a lot of folks really benefit by just having someone to talk to, right? Um, sometimes it means having someone to talk to and then that person directing them to sort of more formal uh, care system uh, care systems and they these individuals would have training to get people sort of connected to like a formal health system um, in addition um, the it leverages a traditional relationship right the role of the grandmother in uh, in this particular uh, part of Zimbabwe, uh, which was which through uh, mo mo modernization is, is being eroded. And so it's really leveraging a traditional role and saying that traditional role is really important. And in addition, not only does it help the people who are coming to sit, it actually helps the grandmothers too, right? It gives them a role in their culture, in their society. It's, it's, not, it's, it's not discarding who they are. And I think for me, it's like that kind of intervention is really, uh, really inspiring community resilience. So I'm not saying it's the only solution, but it's part of what we, I think we really need to do is to, is to understand that, uh, um, you know, when we design a healthcare system, we really need to think very broadly. We need to have a campaign that really helps people to understand that we're all suffering and the way forward, the way to, uh, come out of uh, come out of suffering. Sometimes is is uh, is about getting uh, formal mental health help, and sometimes it's about uh, resources that actually are exist within the community within the community designed by the community that's for the community. So so let me um, thanks for those words, Dr. Hickox. Let me let me follow that up, and we'll move into the Q and A portion here, where I'm going to take questions that have come in through the chat, and just one that I see here that is you know, related to what you've just shared. Um, it, comes, it comes from the chat. It says, I would agree that formal system, that the formal system can't change quickly. So why not concentrate on funding and supporting community organizations to do some of the innovative work that is needed and to bolstering uh, affordable housing and supports and reducing poverty and those kind of things, which, you know, maybe don't require that massive policy level <laughs> level shift to start picking away at. Yeah, yeah. So so in our office itself, actually, we're, we're putting resources in the next fiscal with the Office of Addictions and Mental Health, right, which is, which is like, this is the office that I work for that's within Department of Health and Wellness. We're putting resources into helping to support um, models of mental health uh, support that ex uh, will exist within a supportive housing model, 
right? And as you probably all know, the Department of Community Services has come out with a sort of uh, a housing strategy, right? Which includes uh, addressing homelessness. Um, for me, uh, you know, it's one of, uh, this is, this is, uh, this is my goal is uh, I want Nova Scotia to be a place where anyone who has a significant mental health or addiction problem and that has led them to be rendered homeless, right? Never have to have nowhere to go. In other words, never have nowhere to go. We'll always have somewhere to go. We'll have somewhere to stay. And when I say that, I don't mean a shelter, right? <laughs> and I don't, I don't mean a, a wooden box in a park. I mean, an actual uh, uh, home, right? That uh, provides uh, folks with the kind of uh, care that they need. It doesn't stigmatize and punish people for engaging in behavior. that's associated with the very, you know, pathologies for which they're suffering. Um, in other words, like kicking people out of, uh, out of a housing project because they're addicted and because they use substances, right? Um, I would like to see anyone who has a mental health or addiction challenge problem. Um, I'd like to see that, which represents the majority of people who are actually homeless in Nova Scotia, the 600 or so people who are homeless. I would like to end that. I would like that to be done. So part of the mandate of my office is to address the social determinants of mental health and to uh, actually uh, work with other government departments, other sectors, including, the, including uh, community-based organizations to actually uh, address these very wicked complex problems and really move the needle on them, okay? So that, that's actually the, the direction that I would like to see us head. Um, you know, from my point of view, it's an obscenity that we have people that are homeless, to be frank. Um, so uh, it's a big lift. I think that where the role, the role of our office is really to help um, look at, uh, to help, uh, you know, uh, test drive, measure and ensure that there are good models of support. You know, when we talk about supportive housing, we, you know, we, there are many, many different ways to do that, many different models. And we have to do it in a way that is, uh, you know, within, within, um, you know, budget, but at the same time actually provides people with what they need because we know that people, we're not giving people what they need for homeless. We're not, we're not meeting their needs. That's why people are being rendered homeless time and again. Thanks for that. Alec, did you have something you wanted to jump in with? Uh, yeah, I was asked to turn my camera and microphone on, so I'll, I'll take oh, uh, okay. some of <laughs> that space. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Cox, for being with us today. Um, you know, one of the things that has consistently come up uh, in the college's own engagement uh, with, uh, uh, you know, folks on this panel here today um, is, uh, again, the ability for, I, I mean, you've laid out a very nice vision, and I think we agree with much of that vision. The challenge that particularly folks uh, who are here today or, or folks uh, like the Canadian Mental Health Association or advocates for change often run up against is, uh, again, uh, top-down systems of government that aren't um, working collaboratively or in consultation with the folks that are impacted by these issues or the folks delivering these services. That's why we were so delighted that you were joining us today to engage in some meaningful consultation and collaboration. Um, so I'm wondering as, again, I mean, you have a relatively new mandate, um, you have a relatively new office. I know it's starting to get staffed up, but what is your commitment to that community consultation and collaboration moving forward? As you saw in many of the presentations, there are lots of lenses here um, and lots of different considerations. How will you, uh, as the leader of this new office and this organization, be able to take that community input, uh, that community experience, that community expertise? There are a lot of experts here as well. Um, and be able to drive a really comprehensive strategy uh, towards some of the visions that you've laid out. Uh, I'll give one more example before I, I, I let you respond. But, you know, advocates for 30 years uh, have been... Um, uh, telling the story of the impact of poverty, particularly childhood poverty and adverse childhood experiences, which contribute greatly to future mental health issues and concerns. I, I mean, we saw in uh, 1989, the um, 
uh, Parliament of Canada passed a resolution that they were going to end child poverty by the year 2000 uh, in Canada. We've blown by that. Uh, and this is an example in which, again, community has been screaming this for 30 years. We have to impact child poverty. We have moved the needle zero in Nova Scotia. Um, and so I'm wondering, again, so it's a two-part question. How do you work with advocates? How do you work with community voices? How do you take all of this to build that comprehensive strategy? Okay, so um, we, uh, first of all, like when we do, when, we're, when we do any, any major, like working on any major mandate item, like for example, universal mental health care would be one, and I'm going to harp on that one again, because it's just front of, <clears throat> it's front of mind, and it's probably our largest mandate item. Uh, we, we are developing a very robust engagement kind of strategy, okay, and that engagement strategy is, uh, you know, is one where we will attempt to uh, and we'll fail, right? But we'll attempt to bring in as many uh, lenses, as many voices, and particularly those with lived experience. You know, what we call first voices, right? Um, because they should be um, <clears throat> as possible. <coughs> Pardon me. We have uh, within the Department of Health and Wellness, a new, uh, since May of this, uh, of this calendar, no, of last calendar year, um, a new uh, Office of Equity and Engagement headed by John Arrio, who's um, um, a really originally a, a Nigerian who's been living in Canada for about five, uh, 25 years. So he's Nigerian Canadian. And he's, uh, he's actually working with, uh, with, you know, government overall to develop what's called the health equity framework. And in that health equity framework, which Nova Scotia doesn't have, by the way. Um, so it'll be Nova Scotia's first. And within that is a very specific engagement uh, strategy. And he's actually someone that's really helping us to sort of work on, on uh, you know, doing this right so that we're actually uh, uh, reaching out to the right people who in uh, BIPOC communities, um, queer communities, et cetera. What we don't want to do is, um, is to just rush in and engage with a few select groups and say, okay, we've ticked off the box, right? We met with one organization that sort of, uh, uh, you know, represents the interests of some people who say are uh, identified as African Nova Scotian. We want to do this right. And uh, in order to do it right, we're going to, you know, we're, we're also going to be connected to uh, uh, broader work that's happening in uh, uh, the Nova Scotia government overall um, to develop an engagement strategy that actually reduces the likelihood that we're going to end up uh, going out again and again and again to communities and, and uh, you know, this government department comes and talks to this group. Then another government department comes. We're trying to do this in a coordinated way. Um, one of the things that we really have heard from communities is we're tired of engagement. We're tired of, of being, you know, asked, well, what, what should we do? We've already told you. Now, can you please do it right you know so i'm not saying that, that therefore we're not going to engage but we want we you know, we want to reduce the, the likelihood that that happens right um so that would that would be sort of an example of 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 you know how i basically i guess what i want to say is that we're baking that into all of what we do now the thing that i want to see right that i don't think has happened historically is not just baking engagement uh with community and first voices as well as clinicians um, into the planning and the development, I want to see um, particularly those with lived experience actually involved in the governance, actually involved in the ongoing, you know, kind of uh, uh, oversight, right? Now, my office, it's our job to do oversight for the mental health system, right? Overall, like, uh, you know, we're civil servants, that's kind of our job, right? So you know, I'm not going to be disingenuous and say, you know, therefore, you know, it's just going to be this beautiful thing where we're going to have uh, people with first, uh, you know, people with lived experience or first voices uh, doing governance who are outside of that. They're not civil servants, right? And so they are they going to have no powers, it's just going to be tokenism, right? But when we think about a program, right, when we think about a project, like, for example, the withdrawal management kind of project that I know that you folks had referenced previously, which, by the way, I'm very happy to speak uh, more about, uh, but, uh, you know, we, we actually are planning to have 
um, like a governing body that's really measuring how is this going and so on. And that governing body will have people with lived experience right on, you know, in that, in that, uh, you know, that board or uh, oversight committee or advisory committee, however, it ends up getting actually structured. Okay. So I think that that, and that's good trauma informed care, right. Um, you know, I've been really influenced by some of the thinking around TIC coming out of BC. And that's the, you know, that's a really important piece is, is you want to have people with lived experience actually there. And it, it just makes sense, right? It's just very practical, right? Um, so, you know, I, I would say that, that that's the goal. And that's something that I'm advocating for in our program development is how we're gonna actually have people with lived experience there on the ground, not just once, not just asking for advice or, you know, a, a blessing, but actually there on an ongoing basis. Yeah, and I think that that addressed another, another question that was asked earlier in the chat about actually using, <laughs> first voice people in the decision making before it, you know, you get to the rubber stamping process of yeah. engagement, which usually happens in government. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to wrap, I'm, I'm going to um, get some, some quick fire responses from you, Dr. Hickox, if it's possible, I'm going to ask a couple of questions for you. Uh, just try and get through as many questions as I can while I have you okay. before okay. we move into closing. Uh, so, well, one, uh, one question that I saw in chat uh, was about uh, opening up the additional addiction tubs. And what yeah. are the, what's the timeline on that? Yeah, yeah, so, so uh, one hub open in Dartmouth, um, uh, by, the end of, uh, uh, by the end of the summer, there should be uh, uh, at least two, if not, yeah, two, two more hubs in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Cape Breton. Um, there, there's, a, there's a new, in, uh, is it, no, there's a, there's a hub that's been open in New Glasgow that will also have inpatient uh, folks um, as well. And by the end of fiscal, there should be, uh, basically the three, there's three ambulatory, uh, withdrawal management, uh, uh, sites in the Western zone, and they're all going to be converted to hubs as well. So I, th I think I captured every, oh, and then a second hub. So by the end of next fiscal, there'll be also, that'll all be up and running and there'll be a second hub. That's the goal in, uh, in, uh, like somewhere more in the downtown core of Halifax as well, okay? I'll just emphasize this, that there actually have been no cuts to beds, okay, for withdrawal management. Um, I'm gonna be frank about this. There's been a narrative that's been consistent for years that there was no consultation um, and uh, in, in the PICTO area in terms of closing down the PICTO inpatient withdrawal management unit. Um, I know there's a lot of hurt feelings and hard feelings around that. I would actually contest that there was no consultation. I'll be honest with you about that. Um, and I can kind of point to examples or whatever, but, but what's really important to know is that there actually have been no cuts in beds. Um, the, that, that unit in particular had to close down during COVID because of um, Canada-wide uh, requirements uh, for COVID safety that that facility just could not meet actually. And I'll say this as well. We know that historically, <clears throat> Um, inpatient withdrawal management units across the province, the average census, so these are like hospital floors, the average bed occupancy runs between 35 and 50 percent, okay? And it's not because there aren't people in these sites, in, in these communities who need addiction care. It's that the threshold to enter into those programs was too high. It wasn't meeting, pe meeting people's needs, right? So um, we're keeping all the beds open and the beds are provincial. Okay, and there's approximately 22 beds across the province, but the hubs are another option. They're part of a continuum, right? right. And uh, they'll have a lower threshold for entry into, into care. Absolutely, some people need inpatient care. And we will, in the future, don't know about this yet, right? But explore where, where does long-term, uh, you know, residential recovery fit into this? And that was mentioned before. Mm -hmm. And so I think we're, we're coming up to the, to the end of our time here. I do want to emphasize to everyone who's joined us and have, have put your questions in the chat. We can see them all. We are going to forward, we've committed to forward them, forwarding them to, to Dr. Hickox's office. Um, so I, I apologize about not, getting, uh, not having the opportunity to get through all of the questions, but this is always the case when we have a, a forum like this. Um, you know, if, if I could just talk briefly about some overall themes that we're seeing here, you know, there's, I think there's agreement that we need to look more broadly beyond the biomedical model that is currently dominating the, the system 
And so there's an appetite, at least from the senior bureaucrat level, to, to push the system towards a, uh, towards a more um, uh, community-focused uh, approach that really puts people at the center. Um, and, you know, throughout the discussion that we've seen here, we see that, uh, you know, everybody's, you know, money doesn't grow on trees and it, there's a constant need for money into the system. But there's also a wide recognition that if you don't address problems in a community based way, or if you don't have the supports in the community, those costs spiral out of control, because they just end up in crisis in crisis mode, which is always almost always more expensive. Uh, and so, you know, uh, one of the things that, you know, I'll take this privilege as moderator to raise is one thing that we've always been pushing for is core funding from the provincial government to community mental health organizations. And this has not changed in over 10 years, the level of core reliable operations funding. There's been a lot of grants that have come through uh, for various organizations, but core, stable, reliable funding so that people can build their communities around and support each other is something that I think uh, a lot of the organizations who've been involved with this discussion uh, are looking for. A reliable source of funding to put people in place to allow people to support each other. Um, and so with that said, uh, I, I wanna thank you for taking the time. I know technical difficulties, we all live in this Zoom pandemic world. so. Uh, we appreciate you uh, having the chance to come over. And, uh, you know, if we hope to be able to speak to you and people from your office in the future to keep this uh, conversation going between uh, community and uh, the folks who make the decisions. All right. Okay. Well, thanks a lot. It's really, it really is a, a privilege for me. And I appreciate the time. <clears throat> Again, apologies. And so I look forward to some further conversation for sure. So thanks a lot. All right. And I think Anne.